Awesome guys, so welcome to the Staking Podcast. I'm today sitting with none other than Joseph Amrani, uh, IST advisor and Cosmos contributor, and Chris Berg from the Agoric Economic Committee. Today we're going to have a really cool conversation on IST, the stable coin of, of the interchain protocol, if I'm not mistaken, and talk over all the, the stable coin landscape. Uh, again, guys, uh, welcome to the show. How are you feeling? Awesome. Thank you so much for having us. Pretty good. Thanks, Del, for uh, having us. Looking forward uh, to this uh, episode. Oh, me too, man. Uh, <laughs> thank you again for joining. So let's, let's get this one out of the way uh, before we get into the topic. If you can go briefly, go over yourself, who are you, what you do in the ecosystem, and maybe a little background of you. If you want to start yourself and then Chris. Yeah, sure. So uh, my name is uh, Youssef Amrani. Uh, I'm a Cosmos Hub uh, core contributor. Uh, recently worked on the Atom 2.0 uh, white paper. Uh, have a previous experience as a researcher uh, at uh, Messari, where I was covering uh, DeFi and uh, core infrastructure. And I'm currently also advising uh, Inche Protocol uh, elected member with Chris uh, of the uh, Economic uh, Committee for the ISC stablecoin that just uh, recently launched, actually, a few weeks ago. And uh, my name is Chris Berg. I'm a academic um, a crypto economist uh, based in Melbourne, Australia. I run a my day job is running a um, very large, in fact, the world's first social science research center into blockchain technology. I'm um, an economist or a crypto economist. Um, I've been advising Agoric for for many years, um, and uh, and when we came up with the idea originally or, or when we conceived of the idea of having a stable coin as part as a core part of the uh, agoric ecosystem it was a really exciting opportunity to get more involved um uh which was wonderful that the um the builder community the agoric community um uh, voted use of myself and um some other people into the economic committee to make ist or at least um help make ist a reality and hopefully push it around the uh, the Cosmos ecosystem and the interchain community as much as we can. Awesome. And yes, I, I remember the, the proposal for establishing the economic committee. Uh, let, let's see, Chris, uh, can you briefly go over about what is IST? Or maybe you said, yeah, take this one. Um, I, I, I might jump in. So IST is a stable coin. Um, IST is a stablecoin with a with a um, that began with a very particular purpose. Um, when we were thinking about what does the economy of Agoric look like, um, the goal of Agoric is to onboard the next generation of developers into um, into cryptocurrency and blockchain. Um, uh, it's a JavaScript based smart contracting platform, which means that all the developers in the world who can do JavaScript in the Web two world in um, uh, uh, across the uh, across the programming ecosystem, across the programming world, can can get onto um, get into Agoric, so and and can make their own smart contracts and spin them up with the tools that they're used to. That's really exciting. Um, so we've always been thinking about, well, how can we onboard um, uh, traditional companies, Web two businesses, people who are used to doing business in the real world, how can we bring them into um, the crypto economy? And one of our first insights was, um, well, you kind of need some sense of stability. We're going to need a stable token of some description because you don't want to have to ask traditional businesses, people are used to making um, uh, traditional financial decisions to bear foreign exchange risk effectively and to have to pay their fees, their on-chain fees in some fluctuating currency, which is the norm across across the blockchain ecosystem. So that's that's where the idea for IST really came. We we want to have a a native stable coin that you can pay your fees in Agoric with, so that you um so that businesses have predictable costs over time. They can project out those costs. Um, there's going to be a degree of stability um, and so forth. But of course, as we um, uh, as as the crypto ecosystem has evolved, the role of stable coins has become 
incredibly important. And it turns out that they are a core piece of infrastructure. Um, the uh, IST doesn't just have to serve the needs of people who are building on Agoric, but it turns out that um, the entire interchain ecosystem, the entire Cosmos ecosystem, is has really been crying out for a Cosmos native stablecoin, a decentralized stablecoin that can um, uh, that can provide you know. Uh, a, a degree of stability to the ecosystem that can be a backbone of economic exchange across the ecosystem, and and that's and that's what IST is is well that that's the intention behind IST. Awesome, uh, I think so that if you say if you want to add something to that, yeah. So I think uh, Chris has uh, made a uh, a lot of of good points. Uh, I would just add that. Um, after the, 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 the tragic collapse of, uh, of Terra, uh, there's now uh, a huge void uh, in the stablecoin space, especially within uh, Cosmos. Uh, and so uh, we, uh, IST, we aim to take uh, a portion of, uh, of uh, basically the, what, what, what's left from, uh, from the Terra uh, collapse. And uh, like like Chris said, I think uh, stablecoins they're crucial for for DeFi. I think with, without DeFi, uh, without stablecoins, actually, uh, they wouldn't be DeFi because you absolutely need uh, a stable currency uh, to make DeFi happens. So to uh, use it in uh, in liquidity pools, in lending, in in uh, borrowing, uh, saving accounts, uh, and if you look at the past. Uh, die from ethereum is basically what uh what allowed uh defi uh to take off so for now in the stablecoin space um we we uh, the stablecoin serves as, as a unique account and also for cross-border payments for example in commerce but in the future uh i think that the the, uh, the purpose of uh, of stablecoins uh can be can be we can have multiple purposes. For example, we can envision payments in, in, in the off-chain world. We've seen Visa, Mastercards that are rushing to uh, to allow payments processing with stablecoins, and also uh, stablecoins can act uh, as a means of payment, uh, like Chris said, blockchain fees. But not only it could, it could also be uh, NFT marketplace, you know, for to finance purchases. Uh, it can be also uh, in the in the gaming economy, so I think that we have multiple purpose and we've barely scratched the surface as of today. So I think going forward, we're gonna see more uh, use cases appear for uh, for stable coins. And if you look at the, the top five uh, largest uh, cryptocurrencies, well, three of them uh, are are um, are stable coins. So you have uh, USDT, USDC, and uh, BUSD from Binance that uh, you know have the lion's share. So that's just uh, for us uh, as an additional motivation to uh, to to keep going with IST. And I agree with you that there are many uses for the stable coins, and user prefer those because of that stability that they offer you at least in the in the USD value price. I know people that like to. Do some trading right, and if they are on profit, they turn those into a stable coins, so they can keep those profit, uh, right? Uh, there yeah, are there yeah. are other. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, sure, uh, I was gonna say that there are other, other many other stable coins in the ecosystem, or at least trying to launch, and some of them are like fully collateralized. Other are like over collateralized. Other have some kind of collateralization. Other are just algorithmic. Uh, would you mind going over those different kinds of stable coins and maybe saying the pros and cons of them? Yeah, of course. So, um, uh, uh, in fact, um, IST is a combination of both over collateralized and fully collateralized. So right now, with um, or the um, uh, peg stability module has been. Um, released. The um, PSM, which is a model that's actually used by um, MakerDAO with their stablecoin. The PSM allows you to swap um, fiat-backed stablecoins 
or other stable coins one for one into the um, into IST. And so in that sense, they are fully collateralized. There's it's a dollar for dollar. It's um, one USD equals one IST um, definitionally. You can swap in and out. Um, and so forth, and and people can arbitrage through that when they see that there's some some sort of price distinction. Um, in Q1, the current plan is in Q1 of next year, though, um, uh, we will be launching, or um, the community will be launching, a um, vault mechanism. This will allow for the over collateralized um, uh, over collateralized tokens like. Um, Adam, like Osmo, to um, uh, to be lent for IST. So it's again, it's a maker style model where you can put in your Adam. Say you put in one hundred and fifty dollars worth of Adam, and out of that you can borrow against that Adam one hundred dollars worth of IST. Um, and obviously, if the price of Adam goes down, there'll be a liquidation model, and um, uh, and or you could you could pay it off and so forth. So there's actually going to be a bunch of different modules and we're talking about lots of other different ways that one might be able to mint IST because th there's a few things first the 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 more capabilities that your stablecoin has the um uh, more protected it is against um uh, any given asset fluctuation in the economy um but the second is that we want this to be an economic tool that users of um or the participants in the interchain ecosystem can use. If you want to be able to borrow against your Atom, that's the place that you'll be able to do so. Same with Osmo, same with um, hopefully many other types of collateral that the community will propose for um, uh, for for collateral types in, in, um, in, in IST. Got it. Thanks for that, Chris. Uh, I noticed that the uh, IST, is, it's already launched, right? It's already live. Uh, people are able to mint uh, these IST. I don't know if you're safe if you would like to go over the stats of that and how to see, how's it going for IST after the launching? I think we're uh, we're pretty happy uh, and uh, it's a it's a positive surprise. So uh, we've launched three weeks ago, I think on um, October 27 to be more uh, specific, and we've crossed uh, the one million. Uh, minted so 1.1 million to be uh, exact uh, so i think those are you know early signs of a of a strong product market fit um, we have a debt limit currently uh, set at 5 million so we're more or less used uh, 21 21% of the the debt limit and if you look at um, what are the the collateral that are being used right now so uh, approximately 62% uh, is USDC and uh, 30%, 38% uh, is, uh, is USDT. But we have to mention that uh, USDT limits are lower for the moment. Uh, and we also have uh, incentive on the IST USDC pool on Crescent, which help uh, basically USDC uh, be more present uh, in our collateral. And at the bridge level, um, so 65% of the minting comes from uh, from Axelor and 35% come, uh, comes from Gravity. Uh, but again, this is normal uh, since we have a positive bias toward uh, um, Axelor in terms of, uh, of minting limits. Awesome, man. And, and be before going over the limits, uh, you, you mentioned the depth limit. There is also a total mint limit that I would like to ask you about. But before that, uh, I noticed that you also did some initiatives on osmosis and crescent to, to farm IST, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. So so we have, so, so basically how uh, those um, products work, so uh, speaking about crescent and osmosis, you have uh, internal incentives and you have external incentives. Uh, so on uh, on Crescent uh, we have both, uh, so that's why we're we're seeing more liquidity right now. Uh, IST liquidity within uh, Crescent. We have uh, checked a few like a few hours ago. It was four hundred and fifty thousand dollars of IC there, and on Osmosis uh, we had uh, uh, external um, incentive, but not yet. Uh, internal internal incentives, but I think they just 
got voted in yesterday, so the, the internal incentives should maybe start today or, or tomorrow. Uh, and so we have uh, currently 150,000 uh, IST uh, on, uh, on osmosis. Awesome, awesome. Well, it, it seems the campaign is going full of steam uh, yeah. for this IST farming. And, and b before going the, the limits again, and, and to close out this topic for the initiatives, uh, are there any plans to integrate with other networks uh, in the Cosmos ecosystem or maybe outside the ecosystem? Uh, for now, for now, it's it's really about Crescent and uh, and Osmosis, but uh, we're closely monitoring the the liquidity situation, uh, and I think we will go wherever uh, we find uh, you know strong demand, wherever we anticipate uh, a good demand for IC, and we see that there is uh, uh, enough liquidity. So we started, I think, with the with the two largest. Uh, but we're definitely open to, uh, you know, to grow in uh, uh, in more uh, venues. But that is up to the to the Big DAO community. We can only make you know suggestions. At the end of the day, uh, popular vote is uh, what defines uh, uh, pretty much everything. Mm, that's the key, and and that is what I like about these networks personally. Right? <laughs> this decentralized economy. So, uh, Yusef, I, I told you I wanted to ask about the depth limit and the total mint limit. Uh, what are these about and, and why they're important? Want to go there, Chris? Yeah, sure. So, uh, at the moment, the maximum that can be minted across all the different collateral types is, is 5 million IST. Um, we've chosen that because the um, PSM only approach or the, the minimum viable product is the PSM only approach. And we want to make sure that that's quite conservative. So we don't want to get in front of our skis. We um, are really looking forward to the um, release of the vault. That's that's the most exciting part, I think, of the Inter Protocol. But we also want to make sure that this this um, uh, this this tool, this this token, is available for the Cosmos ecosystem as well. Obviously, as Yusuf says, um, our role in the Economic Committee is to constantly keep looking at these minting limits, see what the what the balances are of different collateral types. But um, uh, we, we've only minted, well, the community has only minted 1.1 million out of 5 million, so we're nowhere near that limit. If we got to that limit, we might reconsider about the appropriateness of that limit, um, but for now we've we've got that up and uh, up as is, which is which 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 seems seems to be fine. I think we want the we want IST to grow. We want it to be not just available for the interchain community, but we want it to be available for the whole crypto economy and ultimately the global economy. Um, uh, it will have to scale with that, but our mandate is to manage risk and to provide a careful risk managed and conservative approach to the release of, of um, IST because the most important thing is that it is a reliable and stable stable coin. That's what stable coins are for. And it's our job to, um, to, to hopefully, um, uh, uh, you know, do, do what we can to ensure that's the case. I mean, before, before going full steam on, on growth, like, Chris said, uh, we need to prove ourselves as a stable currency. And we've seen in the past that many currencies that called themselves stable currency, stable currencies were not. So I think uh, in our case, uh, growing uh, slowly but surely, and then all at once, once the, the design uh, is, uh, is solid enough and uh, we have confidence that we can... Uh, expand to a much bigger market but for now design is everything and uh, and uh, we'll take it uh you know slowly uh yeah slowly yeah i mean there there is a point to make here as well that um uh one of the problems that um uh that that terra luna had was was growth but it was designed in a way that growth actually made it much more a risky proposition the faster it grew it, a, it had to keep growing, and B, the faster it grew, 
the more dangerous it became. And of course, we saw that collapse. We're in a much better position because the, the, the more we grow, the actual better risk management there is. There's more collateral types. There's more flexibility in the system. So growth is, growth is great for us. Growth actually adds stability rather than in the case of algorithmic stable coins, these non-collateralized or under-collateral stable coins. They get riskier the more they grow. We get stronger the more they grow. But nonetheless, um, it is our job in the economic committee to um, to be conservative on this, um, uh, to to uh, allow IST to grow, allow IST to do everything that the community wants it for, but also to make sure that we're being we're being careful and we're managing any potential risk as they come through. Come through. And I would like also uh, Daniel to just uh, give the community, uh, give your audience a reminder because. It might be a bit uh, confusing sometimes because we have so many types. Uh, actually, we don't have so many types. We have four types of stable coins. So I just wanted to go super quickly over them. So, so you have the fully collateralized stable coins that are usually uh, fiat baked, uh, fiat backed. Sorry. So they're uh, issued by um, centralized issuers like Circle and Tether, and so in that in that model, each crypto dollar is backed by one full dollar in the off-chain world on the bank account. So that's the first one, the fully collateralized. The second one is the over-collateralized. So that would be IST or DAI. So that's a mix of fully collateralized stable coin and non-stable tokens. For example, Atom uh, for IST or ETH for, for DAI. The third category is algorithmic stable coins that are basically under collateralized. So that would be UST. And the last uh, category would be uh, what we call uh, hybrid stable coins that are partly collateralized uh, and partly algorithmic. So that would be, I think Frax is the one who uh, basically uh, invented this, uh, this model. Awesome, you said, well, thank you for clearing that out, man. <laughs> really, really handy information. Sometimes uh, we just assume that stable coins are all the same, but there are very uh, different mechanisms behind them, right? Yeah. <laughs> and and, 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 and like, like Chris said, so IST will be basically a mix between fully collateralized stable coins and over collateralized stable coins. So for now, we're fully collateralized, right? Uh, but once we launch uh, vaults, it will be over collateralized because vaults work uh, with the basically uh, the over collateralization uh, uh, method. Basically, you know, I wanted to ask about these vaults. Uh, so, if I understand correctly, uh, I can go ahead and bring my atom and and mint IST, and that atom that I use is going to go to to these vaults, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So, okay, so yeah. So basically, what happens is that. Uh, let's say you have uh, $150 of Atom, uh, you would put it in the vault. And since vaults are over collateralized, you would get less than $150 that you put. So you would get, for example, $100 of, uh, of IST. And then um, if ever uh, the, the value of your Atom falls below a certain threshold, then what happens is we have the liquidation that happens where you pay uh, a small liquidation fee. Uh, the protocol, so IST, uh, liquidates your position. Uh, and if there is something remaining, uh, returns it back to you. Correct, uh, Chris? Yeah, that, that's right. So um, the idea is that we need to, if we're going to mint IST using a collateral of a fluctuating asset like Adam or Osmo, um, we need to make sure that there's a buffer so that um, uh, we are always, we, we don't want to under collateralize the, the, the protocol. That would be, that would be very bad. So we have a buffer just in case the price of Atom drops um, uh, and, and to protect us that it doesn't drop below the value of the IST, which has been minted. Um, so we've got this mechanism that um, uh, the economic committee, in fact, that's one of our roles to nominate a debt limit. Um, uh, and and um, a collateralization ratio for any given 
um, asset like Atom or Osmo or Secret or or interchange or, 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 or bridged assets like Dai and 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 in fact Ethereum or or Zcash or whatever it is that the community wants to bring on. Um, and if the Atom price or if the collateral price drops below that um, uh, that collateralization ratio, then it goes into effectively a liquidation mode where the protocol will try to sell that collateral for as much as possible and return it to the holder. So it means that, you know, if you're doing this, if you're participating in minting on vaults, you've got to, you've got to monitor exactly how much your collateral is worth. Um, but having said that, it allows people who hold Atom to actually borrow against that Atom. If they've got wealth, they can borrow against that wealth in order to, um, to fund other things. If they want to get leverage with that, that's an interesting way to get leverage on on um, any given token that you might be holding, so it's it's basically a really powerful and compelling financial primitive that is built into the design of the stablecoin. So you may not even be that interested in IST as a stablecoin per se, but you might want to be able to borrow against your atom. Well, using the inter protocol, you can do exactly that, or your Osmo, or what have you. Um, uh, which is why which is why it's really exciting. Which is um, why we're really keen to see it roll out in the in the interchain ecosystem. Don't worry, you're on mute. I'm, I'm muted. I'm muted. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, what I was saying is that yeah, it's actually really cool, and it gives you the convenience uh, of not having to sell your asset uh, for fiat. You can instead just uh, put it against something and and, and and get bored at that amount, right? And, and yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and, and then that's that. Basically, that I see you're minting against your atom is just a starting point. So after you get that I see, you get you can engage uh, in various uh, DeFi activities such as uh, putting it maybe in some kind of saving account to to generate yield or uh, maybe uh, borrow it uh, you know you can do a, a lot of of different stuff so that that's usually what people would do uh when they when they meet when they meet in stablecoin uh based on a vault awesome it's great to have that utility and and that price stability uh you ha having an asset that you can uh being confident that the price is going to remain uh, consistent or in a range, uh, I believe that's really handy. Uh, we already talked about those benefits. So I don't know if you, yourself, or maybe Chris, if you would like to go over on the per stability module or the PSM so we can learn more about it. Yeah, of course, I'll take that. So um, the PSM, as I said, is the, it's the um, uh, initial launch of um, InterProtocol. It's not the only launch, but the product peg stability module, the PSM, allows us to allows users to swap stable coins in for IST. So they can take um, uh, tokens that are already a dollar um, and they can swap it for one dollar's worth of IST. At the moment, those stable coins available on the PSM are USDC um, Circle and USDT, which of course is Tether. What we're really excited by at the moment is there's a community proposal right now to bring um, MakerDAO's DAI into the PSM, which um, I, I know Yusuf and I and the rest of the economic committee are really, really keen to do. There's been discussions about bringing on Paxos um, or even um, uh, what what is effectively, as I understand, the white labeled version of Paxos, which is the USD, Binance is USD as well. Um, in, in this way, it effectively functions. It's not the same as a stable swap in that curve model or in the model that um, I understand is being launched on osmosis, but it allows you to swap, swap easily, cheaply between two multiple stable coin types, obviously IST, but USDC, USDT, DAI, Paxos, BUSD, whatever whatever the community can bring on. So again, it's, um, it's actually a really compelling piece of financial infrastructure. One of the challenges that we have across the crypto economy is that there's just so many representations of US dollars. They all have different risk profiles. They've all got different origins. Um, they're all got different, you know, how they relate to different bridges and so forth. 
but ultimately, I as a consumer of of crypto, I I don't really want to be thinking too much about which token I or which which version of US dollars I have. I just want good, reliable US dollars. Um, hopefully, IST by collating a lot of these um, tokens together can be a candidate for that reliable, um, stable coin, but but just as usefully, people can trade in and out of those to get whatever they want. Yeah, and also, I would... I also, I, I would also add that um, PSM is maybe like a key feature uh, uh, in maintaining the, the 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 peg stability because when you rely on vaults, uh, basically you rely on uh, the efficiency of your liquidation uh, mechanism which includes volatile assets so if ever uh, there is an issue with the with the liquidation engine uh, then you can you know violently lose the peg uh, so th that is one of the reasons why we have the psm because the psm is only uh, only includes basically stable assets so the the risk of dpeg is you know is uh, i would say uh, much uh, much lower and basically psm it enables low cost uh fast arbitrage so that's that's a a big plus um and you know as as the as ist matures uh we also expand uh, uh the number of assets that uh, are within uh within the the psm so chris talked about about dai uh possibly paxos uh but you know uh we'll consider uh, a uh, wide uh, array of assets that are that we think uh, are uh, relevant to the mission of uh, IST. But anyway, uh, I think it's very clever uh, starting this uh, PSM with stable coins, right? As they are less volatile. Uh, do you do you think that? Well, you 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 said something related to that, but how long do you think it will take the community to add? other volatile assets like maybe Atom or maybe Bitcoin to the PSM? So that that will be available once, or the, the, the technical capability will be available once we launch Vaults, once Vaults are launched in, um, in Q1 next year. I expect, and Yusuf is um, really close to the community, but I, I expect that the interchain community is going to be really eager to propose collateral types for those Vaults like Adam Osmo, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Zcash, what, what, what have you? I, I think that this is a pro, a product that is in, going to be in a great deal of demand. Of course, we're moving into an interchain ecosystem that's um, going to be much more exciting. There's a lot more financial primitives available with um, uh, with with various types of superfluid staking and and various staking derivatives and all that sort of thing. So it's actually a really exciting time to be launching something in the interchain ecosystem. Um, and what we're keen to do is we, we want to bring on we want to bring on the blue chips. We want to bring on Adam. We want to bring on Osmo. We want to bring on ETH, Bitcoin, what have you. But it's really exciting and it's going to be really interesting to discuss and to um, bring on board some of these derivative uh, tokens, some of these um, more complex financial instruments, um, some of the LP tokens that might be on Osmo or Crescent or so forth, and and really really keen to see what the community is interested um, uh, that that is available for inter protocol users. Yeah, and I'll also add that uh, you know vaults are are once we launch them are going to be the main driver. Uh, behind the, the, the decentralization of uh, of IST because all IBC assets basically are decentralized assets that are censorship resistant. Uh, and so, because right now, right, we have more like centralized stable coins, but uh, with the addition of DAI and then vaults, you know, we're going to move further down the line towards more more decentralization. And I think this is a, this is a, a key aspect and that is... Uh, the end goal uh, for us uh, to to become fully decentralized uh, at some point. Thanks for that, Yusef. That sounds really cool, uh, guys. Uh, we're almost wrapping up this session. Again, I'm very happy that I was able to to have this conversation with you guys. I appreciate your insight. Uh, is there anything? 
you want to share right now that maybe we didn't touch on before? Go ahead, Chris. Uh, no, just that we're really, really excited to be launching this project. Um, so that's my printer going on in the background there. Apologies. <laughs> I'm really excited to be launching uh, into protocol. But what the, I, I, it's a great series of financial primitives. It's going to be a spectacularly um, important stable coin. But I think um, uh, the, the end game here is really the same end game as the Agoric platform itself which is to bring the world's economy truly online, to have a fully digital economy. I think that the Agoric ecosystem itself, the Agoric smart contracting platforms, the virtual machine, is actually a really powerful way to do that. We at Interprotocol, at least the Economic Committee, are really excited to be able to um, support that, not just for the interchain community, but for... Um, the crypto economy and ultimately the global economy as a whole. Um, the We know that the upside opportunity from blockchain and cryptocurrency is enormous. That's what my academic research has been focused on for the last nearly decade. Um, uh, wow. And and that's what excites that's what excites us about crypto. I'm I'm sure and all the listeners here as well. And we think that with Agoric, with the Inter Protocol, we've got a really powerful offer to the rest of the world to bring the global economy online. Awesome, awesome. Well, you, you heard it, guys. That's Agoric and the future and IST. Uh, you know, yourself, uh, this, this uh, can be a little off topic, but it's still DeFi, so it's part of the topic. I don't know if, if it was in your Twitter that I saw it, but it was a quote that it says, adopt DeFi or die. If you can expand a little on that, uh, because I'm curious why you, why you tweeted that. Yeah, that's a very good question. <laughs> well, I mean, this cycle, what we've seen is uh, CFI uh, doing all kinds of weird things, right? So when we say CFI, centralized finance within crypto, obviously. So uh, we had uh, uh, the fall of uh, FTX. Uh, we had also uh, a bunch of other uh, tragic losses from cent some, from other centralized exchange. And basically what that tells us is that the lack of transparency, the lack of uh, auditability uh, are a danger uh, and that they do not, those CFI players, in my mind, they do not represent uh, the real crypto space. The real crypto space is DeFi. And so the way I see it is those CeFi players, they're just uh, an, uh, a step before we, we finalize the migration, the migration of crypto. So basically from uh, the, the off-chain world to, the, to a completely on-chain world. And we needed an intermediary step, which was CeFi. And I think the same about stablecoins. Right now we're seeing centralized stable coins and i think they're just uh an uh, uh how you say a transition uh toward uh fully decentralized stable coins and so defi by design i think is a is a much better product because uh for one uh you self custody your assets and so there is no risk of a, of a bank run ever by design uh for two uh you have full transparency uh, at any moment in time, you, you can look at uh, the different reserves, at pretty much everything. So, yeah, DeFi is better by design. And uh, and it, so basically, I think that right now, I mean, for sure, no one is happy uh, about what's happening with, with CeFi, but I think it's going to be a catalyst uh, for DeFi because people are just going to realize that DeFi is a, is a way better product in all aspects. Basically. Thanks for that. I won't add nothing more to that. I think it was uh, great, and I do agree with you, uh, Joseph. Thanks for sharing. Again, th uh, Chris, thank you also for your time, uh, guys. Uh, where can people know more about Agoric and IST? So um, Agoric obviously has a website with there's lots of documentation, um, uh, agoric.com. Um, uh, there's an inter-protocol website as well with the white paper and lots of documentation 
about that too. But obviously, um, in the environment that we're in, the first point of call for most things is Twitter. Um, uh, Agoric and Into Protocol are, are easy to find on Twitter as well. So that's where I would go. So guys, uh, for me, uh, I, it was a big pleasure to speak uh, with figures like you uh, that are building these tools uh, for us, the users of the future, right? Uh, we're building this decentralized economy, and I'm very happy that you're contributing to that future. So let's see how it pans out, right? I just wish you the best of luck uh, from my end. <laughs> Thank you very much. Paul. Thank you for having us and uh, looking forward to uh, connect with you uh, at uh, another time. Thank you, Chris, also for uh, for joining me in this episode. No, thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, Neil Ryan. Thanks. Have a great day. All right. Take care, guys. And that was all for today's episode. I hope you found this valuable. Please remember to follow us on Twitter and join our Discord and Telegram for more. Until next time.